Chapter 36, The American Zenith, uh, March, don't know what it is, we're under quarantine 2020. Uh, for this year, all you need to know is, in this chapter, anything that is relevant to uh, the effects of World War II um, and how this is relevant in the Cold War. Affluence and anxieties, in what way did science and technology impact economic growth? Why did in 1950s see a decline in union membership? What was the cult of domesticity? Who was Betty Friedan and the feminine mystique? Chapter Introduction Our soil is fertile, our agriculture productive, the air rings with the song of our industry. Rolling mills and blast furnaces, dynamos, dams, and assembly lines, the course of America the Bountiful. We live in a land of plenty, but rarely has this earth known its peril as today. Unmatched in power or plenty, the United States bestrode the world like a colossus as the 1950s began to unfold. Broadly sharing prosperity fueled confidence in the country's capacity to tackle major problems at home and abroad. Both problems abounded nonetheless. Americans at mid-century were dug to the front line of the global war. While bitterly divided at home over the explosive, oh, oh, ex uh, explosive issues of communist subversion and civil rights. So what this is saying is uh, during this time, Americans are very much split um, in between supporting the Cold War, being anti-Soviet, anti-communist, or focused on civil rights and that those civil liberties should not be uh, taken away. Affluence and its anxieties. The continuing post-World War II economic boom wrought wondrous changes in American societies in the 1950s. Prosperity triggered a fabulous surge in home construction as nation of centers became a nation of owners. One of every four homes standing in America in 1960 had been built during the 1950s, and 83% of those homes were in suburbia. In a marked in a period marked by massive military spending and public investment in research, science, and technology, uh, technology drove economic growth more than ever. The invention of the, tr of the uh, transistor in 1943 sparked, sparked a revolution in electronics and especially in computers. The first electronic computers assembled in the 1940s were massive machines with hundreds of miles of wiring and thousands of fickle cathode ray tubes. Transistors uh, and later printed circuits of silicon wafers made possible dramatic miniaturization, phenomenal computational speed. Computer giant international businesses, business machines, IBM, became the prototype of high-tech corporations in dawning information age. Computers transformed the age-old business practices like billing and inventory control and opened new frontiers in areas like airlining, high-speed printing, and telecommunications. Aerospace industries grew fanatically in the 1950s thanks to both the government buildup of the Strategic Air Command, SAT, or SAC, and a robustly expanding passenger airline business, as well as the connections between military and civilian aircraft production. In 1957, the Seattle-based Boeing Company brought out the first passenger jet, the 707, whose design owed much to the previous development of SAC's long-range strategic bomber, the B-52. So as you can see within these last two paragraphs, uh, technology is innovating through the use of the computer, um, but we're also getting uh, large airline companies now start to create, uh, I guess you could say passenger uh, aircraft such as Boeing. The nature of the workforce was also changing. A crucial shift was marked in 1956 when white collar workers worked for the first time outnumbered blue collar workers. Um, signaling the passage from an industrial to post-industrial or service-based economy. Uh, so meaning that we're getting less factory workers and we're getting more people that are in the service economy, more in the offices. Keeping pace with the fundamental transformation, organized labor slowly withered along with the smokestack industries that been its sustenance. Union membership as a percentage of labor forced to peak at about 35% in 1954 when it then went into a steady decline. So as a result of people working less factory jobs, union membership is actually going lower because they're working more office jobs. And with these office jobs and jobs in the service industry, you don't necessarily need um, unions 
at during this time. The surge of white collar employment opened special opportunities for women. When World War II ended, many women, including those who had worked in war plans, returned to highly conventional roles as mothers and homemakers. A cult of domesticity emerged in popular culture to celebrate those eternal feminine functions. When 1950s uh, programs like Ozzy and Harriet or Leave it to Beaver depicted idyllic suburban families with a working husband, two children, and a homebound wife, they did so without irony. Much of the middle class American really did live that way. But as the 1950s progressed, a quiet revolution was gaining momentum that was limited to transform as women roles and even the character of the family, American family. Uh, so one of the things that you want to look at is the effect of World War II is immediately after World War II, uh, you're getting women are going back to those uh, domestic roles. Uh, if you want to see what those roles look like, I recommend that you look at shows. Just go ahead and YouTube search it, such as Leave it to Beaver and Ozzy and Harriet. We'll take a look at some of those in class. Of some 40 million new jobs created in the three decades after 1950, more than 3 million were clerical work and service work. Women filled the huge majority of these new positions. They were principal employment beneficiaries of the post-war era, creating an extensive pink-collar ghetto of occupations that came to be dominated by women. Um, so one thing that you could understand here is as a result of the innovation and science and technological advances during the Cold War, and remember, which is pushed to be able to compete with the Soviets, you're also getting women that are now taking some of these jobs. <laughs> Exploding employment opportunities for women in the 1950s unleashed a ground shell of social and psychological shocks that mounted to a tidal wave for portions of decades that followed. From one perspective, women's surge in the workplace was nothing new, only a return to the days when the United States was an agricultural nation and men and women alike toiled on a family farm. But the urban age is not the agricultural age, and the woman's new, dole, new role as both worker and homemaker raised urgent questions about family life and traditional definitions of gender differences. Very important, you need to know feminist Betty Friedan gave focus fuel to women's feelings in 1963 when she believed and published uh, The Feminine Mystique, a runaway bestseller and a classic of feminist protest literature that launched the women's movement. Friedan spoke in rousing accents to millions of able educated women who applauded her indictment of the stifling boredom of suburban housewifery. So you need to know who she is because she writes Feminine Mystique, and this is questioning a lot of the traditional roles of the cult of domesticity. So I did hit all of these. In what ways did science and technology impact the growth in the 1950s? Uh, we're getting computers, right, which are able to, of course, respond to information more quickly and more efficiently. Um, and also you're getting the development of the passenger airplane, right? Uh, this is also shifting the job force, which leads to a decline in member union membership as less people are working uh, less factory jobs, more uh, white collar versus blue collar jobs. Cult of domesticity, uh, it's the uh, norm that existed right after World War II that the woman's role was specifically to stay at home and take care of the family uh, and the household. And Betty Friedan would challenge this role in the feminine mystique as more women would start to work some of these uh, white collar jobs, these office jobs. So all in all, what you understand is the Cold War and World War II is impacting these things um, because of our connection, our conflict with the Soviet Union. Consumer culture in the 1950s uh, discussed the impact of the following, television, religion, music, what were some criticisms of the new consumerist lifestyles? Um, so this section right here, you probably don't need to know for this coming AP test, but it is very interesting, so I'm going to go through it. The 1950s witnessed a huge expansion of middle class and blossoming of consumer culture to define a distinctive lifestyle. Diner clubs introduced the plastic card in 1949, just one year after the fast food style McDonald hamburger uh, stand, pond opened, stand opened in San Bernardino, California. In 1955, Disneyland opened its doors in Anaheim, California. Easy credit, high volume, fast food production, and new forms of leisure marked an emerging culture of consumption that soon moved beyond America's borders. So what we're getting here is we're getting the creation of the fast food restaurant, right? Um, remember a lot of this time people have moved out to the suburbs, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And um, being able to get, gain food quickly um, was part of the consumer culture back then. 
crucial uh, development in the cons uh, consumerism was a rapid rise in new technology of television. Only six TV stations were broadcasting in 1946. A decade later, 442 stations were operating. TV sets were rich people's novelties in 1940s, but 7 million sets were sold in 1951. By 1960, virtually every American home had one in a stunning display of the speed which new technologies can pervade and transform modern societies. So you're getting the creation of t TV as well as TV networks, and this is uh, kind of convincing people, convincing Americans to engage in this mass consumption of goods. Attendance in movies sank as the entertainment industry changed its focus from the silver screen to the picture tube. By the mid-1950s, advertisers annually spent $10 billion to hawk their wares on television, while critics fumed that the wildly popular new mass medium was degrading the public's aesthetic, social, moral, political, and educational standards. To the question, why is television called a medium, pundits replied, because it's never rare or well done. So uh, people, of course, are criticizing the American television network. Uh, it's questioning our social and moral values and, of course, taking time away from education. Even religion capitalized on a powerful new electronic pulpit. Celebrity preachers and priests like the Baptist Billy Graham, the Pentecostal Holiness preacher Oral Roberts, and Roman Catholic Fulton J. Sheen took to the airwaves to spread the Christian gospel. Television also catalyzed the commercialization of professional sports as viewing audiences that once Numbered uh, in the stadium capacity, thousands can now count, now become in the couch potato millions. Uh, sports also reflected a shift in population towards the West and South. In 1958, baseball's New York Giants moved to San Francisco, and Brooklyn Dodgers abandoned Flatbush for Los Angeles. These moves touched on new westward and southward expansion of sports franchises. Shifting population and spreading influence led eventually to substantial expansion of the major baseball leagues, in the principal football and basketball leagues as well. Uh, so you're getting sports, you're getting churches that are now being televised as well. Uh, eventually you're gonna get a lot of these teams in the West, uh, yeah, move us. Popular music was dramatically transformed in the 1950s. The chief revolutionary was Elvis Presley, a white singer born in 1935 in Toledo or Tupelo, Mississippi. Fusing black rhythm and blues with white bluegrass and country styles Elvis helped to create a new musical idiom known as uh, Forever After Rock and Roll. Rock was crossover music, carrying its heavy beat and driving rhythms across the cultural divide that separated black and white musical traditions. Listening and dancing to rock and roll became a rites of passage for millions of young people around the world. From Japan to working class Liverpool, England, where Elvis's music inspired teenagers, John Lennon and Paul McCartney to form a band that would become the Beatles. So we're getting some of these uh, famous uh, musicians during this time. And a lot of it is spreading not only through radio, but as well as television. Traditionalists were repelled uh, by Presley and much of much else of its affluent 50s. Movie star Marilyn Monroe, with her ingenious smile and dangerous curves, helped to popularize and commercialize new standards of sensuous sexuality. So did Playboy magazine, who first uh, issued Monroe Grace in 1953. As the decade closed, Americans were on were well underway to becoming free consuming spenders of mass produced mass produced standardized products, which were advertised on the electric medium of television and often sold for alleged sexual allure. Many critics lamented the implications of the new conservative lifestyle. Harvard sociologist David Reisman portrayed the post war generation as a pack of conformists in a lonely crowd, and as did William H. Uh, William H. White Jr., an organization man, a novelist, Sloan Wilson, and a man in a gray flannel suit. Harvard economist uh, John Kenneth Galbraith moaned the spectacle of private op opulence amidst uh, public squalor in a series of books beginning with Affluent Society. But Galbraith's call to invest in public good fell on modestly deaf ears in the Gilly Affluent 1950s. Uh, so you're getting a lot of people that are criticizing um, just the type of lifestyle that's going on as a result of this consumption. You know, they want to go back to the more traditionist approach, questioning the morality between Elvis Presley, you know, uh, Marilyn Monroe, uh, as well as the Beatles, um, that's transforming the youth. Discuss the impact of the, yeah, I kind of went over this, uh, spreading, I mean, television, 
<clears throat> you're getting shows that are being spread, such as Leave It to Beaver. Uh, you're getting more sports that are televised. Uh, what the, what it's, um, attendance in theaters are going down. Religion, you're getting some preachers that are spreading their views. Music, Elvis Presley, the Beatles, worldwide, become very famous. Uh, main criticism is it's uh, just getting away from the traditional approaches, more of the conservatism. Uh, it's teaching the wrong social um, social morals. The advent of Eisenhower. Democratic prospects in the presidential election of 1952 were blighted by the military deadlock in Korea. Truman's clash with MacArthur and the war bred inflation. Uh, the spirited Democrats nominated a reluctant uh, Alde E. Stevenson, the eloquent and individualist governor of Illinois. Republicans enthusiastically chose a war hero, General Dwight D. Eisenhower, on the first ballot. Ike's running mate was California Senator Richard M. Nixon, who gained notoriety as a relentless red hunter. Uh, so when you're getting a 1952 election, you're getting uh, Mr. Stevenson from Illinois, uh, Stevenson High School. Actually, that's a school that I didn't teach at, but it was about a mile from where I lived. Uh, it's, I think it's rated one of the top 10 best schools in the country consistently. Uh, he's going against California Senator. Richard M. Nixon, uh, when he's saying he's, uh, and Dwight D. Eisenhower, sorry, is running as, as the president, but uh, Nixon gains his popularity as a result of being a red hunter, meaning he's looking for people that support communism. Eisenhower was already the most popular American of his time. I, like Ike, buttons everywhere testified. Strikingly a grandfatherly, nonpartisan pose, Eisenhower left the rough campaigning to Nixon, who a relish bare knuckle political combat. The vice presidential candidate lambasted his opponents with charges that they had cultivated corruption, caved in on Korea, and coddled communists. He particularly blasted Cerebral Stevenson as Aldi the Peaser with a PhD from Secretary of State Dean Atchison's College of Cowardly Communist Containment. So uh, well, the reason why we're reading this chapter is specifically because of Eisenhower, Nixon, and communism, because you can see this is an effect of the Cold War. Uh, both these men are criticizing the Democratic Party, um, more specifically, I mean, uh, Stevenson at this point, for not being aggressive enough in the Korean War and letting communism spread uh, during that time. Nixon faltered uh, late in the campaign, amid accusations that he had accepted illegal donations, responding with self-pitying uh, live address on television. Nixon denied the charges and saw him declare that the only campaign gift he had ever received was a family cocker spaniel, checkers. The shameless and mawkish checker speech uh, saved Nixon's spot and ticket and spotlighted a fundamental change in American politics. Television was now a formidable political tool that much more than radio allowed candidates to bypass traditional party machinery and speak directly to voters. The future awaited when a critic can observe of selling a president like toothpaste. So as you can see here, television is changing the way that politics are done. Um, they're giving these speeches on television. The outcome of the presidential election in 1952 was never really in doubt. Given an extra prod by Eisenhower's last-minute pledge to go personally into Korea to end the war, voters overwhelmingly declared for Ike. He earned 33 million votes, close to 34, uh, to Stevenson's 27, ringing up 442 electoral votes to 89 for his opponent. Ike also managed to pull Republican legislatures into office uh, with his, on his military coattails to gain GOP to control of the new Congress by hair breath. Through this campaign pledge, President-elect Eisenhower flew to Korea for three days in 1952. Seven bloody months later, an armistice was finally signed. The brutal and futile fighting had lasted three years. More than 30,000 Americans lay dead, joined by perhaps more than a million Chinese, North Koreans, and South Koreans. Tens of billions of American dollars had been lured into the Asian sinkhole. Yet, this terrible toll in blood and treasure uh, bought only a return to the conditions of 1950. Korea remained at the 38th parallel while the border of the broader Cold War frigidly frozen. Uh, so we're getting Eisenhower. He goes ahead and negotiates his armistice, which stops the fighting of the Korean War. I mean, technically, the Korean War is still going on today. Um, but as a result of this, you're getting 30,000 dead and millions of Koreans and Chinese that are killed. Both in the military and civilian realms, Eisenhower had long cultivated a leadership style that self-consciously projected an image of sincerity, fairness, and optimism. In the White House, he now struck the pose of an, ultra, of an unpolitical president, 
serenely above the petty partisan prey. He sh she shrewdly knew that his greatest asset uh, was his enjoyment of the affection and respect of our citizenry as he confided in his diary in 1949. Ike thus seemed ideally suited to soothe the anxieties of Americans who yearned for a period of calm in which they would pursue their new ambitions for consumerist affluence. Abley playing this a few, uh, reassuring role, he presided over a decade of shaky peace and shining prosperity. Yet critics charged that he unwisely hoarded the asset of his immense popularity, where they spend it for a good cause, especially civil rights. And his failure to stand up to McCarthyist uh, demagoguery bubbling up within his own party showed either timidity or opportunism. Uh, so, of course, what we're getting here is um, he... One of the things he's criticized for, of course, is not starting up to uh, McCarthyism. McCarthyism, of course, he's going on this cold hunt of a, a, oh, geez, cold, uh, of a witch hunt, uh, trying to find anyone that's guilty of communism in uh, the government, but as well as uh, just, yeah, I mean, any government jobs. Desegregating American Society. Unfortunately, this section will not be on the AP exam. It should be, um, but still I'm going to go through it because it is very important. If you are an IB, you will need to know this for sure next year, so I recommend that you do read through this section. America counted some 15 million black citizens in 1950, two-thirds of whom still made their homes in the South. There they lived, bound by the iron folkways of segregated society, a rugged set of antiquated rules known as Jim Crow laws, Govern all aspects of their existence, from the schoolroom to the restroom. Every day of their lives, Southern blacks dealt with a bizarre array of separate social arrangements that kept them insulated from whites, economically inferior and politically powerless. Blacks in the South not only attended segregated schools, but were compelled to use separate public toilets, drinking fountains, restaurants, and weight rooms. Trains and buses had whites only and colored only seating. Only about 20% of eligible Southern blacks were registered to vote, and fewer than 5% were registered in some deep South states like Mississippi and Alabama. Were the, law, were the law proved insufficient to enforce this regime, vigilante violence did the job. Six black war veterans claiming the rights for which they had fought overseas were murdered in the summer of 1946. A Mississippi mob lynched black 14-year-old Emmett Till in 1955, allegedly leering at white women. It was small wonder that a black clearman decided that everywhere I go in the South, the Negro was forced to choose between his hide and his soul. So we'll get it here is after World War II. Uh, remember World War II, you had the double V campaign, victory at home and victory overseas. While there is victory overseas, there's not victory at home. The first paragraph kind of discusses this, the effects of Jim Crow laws and continuity that you could go back to the, to the 1880s, still in the 1950s going on. Uh, second paragraph goes over just some of the violent instances. You're getting the killing of Emmett Till, a uh, boy that supposedly whistled at a white woman, which claims to be, you know, now that we found out, never actually happened. Uh, he's killed along with um, some six black veterans, right, claiming that they had fought for their rights overseas. Segregation tarnished America's international image, such as McCarthyism did. After the war, African-American entertainers like Paul Robeson and Josephine Baker toured widely in Europe and Latin America, informing audiences about the horrors of Jim Crow and raising doubt about America's reputation as the beacon of freedom against Soviet communism. Intellectuals poured out criticism as well. Swedish scholar, scholar Gunmar Maidro published his landmark book, An American Dilemma, exposing his scandalous contradiction between the liberty loving American creed and the nation's shameful treatment of black citizens. So you're getting a lot of famous African Americans such as Paul Robeson that's touring the world. And while people claim that America's a land of three, you know, they're at, they're saying that how could you fight communism in the Soviet Union when you don't have freedom at home for African Americans? International pressure combined with grassroots and legal activism to propel some racial progress in the North during and after World War II. In a growing number of Northern cities and states, African Americans battled for and won equal access to public accommodations like restaurants, hotels, theaters, and beaches. Jackie Robinson uh, cracked baseball's color barrier when the Brooklyn Dodgers signed him in 1947. 
the National Adv Advancements Association for Advancement of Colored People, NAACP, pushed push for the Supreme Court in 1950 to rule in Sweat v. Painter that separate professional schools for blacks failed to meet the test of equality. The repeal of the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1943, the Supreme Court's ban in 1948 on court enforcement of racially restrictive housing covenants, and a string of repeals of state level and anti um, disengagement laws signaled a decline of legal discrimination against not only African Americans, but other racial um, and ethnic minorities as well. So this paragraph kind of just discusses some of the games, gains that were happening in the late 1940s and 1950s. The Montgomery bus boycott also catapulted to prominence a young pastor in Montgomery's Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. The 27-year-old seemed an unlikely champion of the downtrodden and disenfranchised. Raised in a prosperous black family in Atlanta and educated partly in the North, he had for most of his life been sheltered from the grossest, from the growth, yeah, the grossest cruelties of segregation. But his oratical skill, um, oratorial skill, skill, sorry, strategic savvy and mastery of biblical and constitutional conceptions of justice and devotion to the nonviolent principle of Indians, um, on Gandhi's all thrust him to the forefront, of the black revolution that soon pulsed across the South and the rest of the nation. So in this paragraph, it's talking about the rise of Montgomery, of uh, Martin Luther King as he gains this through the Montgomery bus boycott. Uh, the bus boycott was, uh, of course, it was when African Americans would stop using the Montgomery bus boys, bus system specifically because uh, of segregation. The bus, the, the, yeah, the busing would, out, would lose a lot of money, thus forcing them to get rid of segregation for buses. Seeds of the Civil Rights Revolution. When horrified Harry Truman heard about the lynching of black war veterans in 1946, he responded by commissioning a report titled to secure these rights. Following the report's recommendations, Truman in 1948 ended segregation in the federal civil service and the armed forces. Yet the conservative coalition of Republicans and the Southern Democrats in Congress refused to pass civil rights legislation. And Truman's White House successor, Eisenhower, showed no real interest in racial issues. In the 1950s was the Supreme Court that assumed political leadership in the civil rights struggle. Um, so when you're looking at 1940s and 1950s, Truman and Eisenhower, uh, they're not necessarily trying to push it. The civil rights movement, so much of the gain is going to be done in, in the Supreme Court. Chief Justice Earl Warren, former Republican governor of California, Shocked traditionalists with his active judicial intervention in previously taboo social issues. Publicly snubbed and privately scorned by Ike, Warren courageously led the court to address issues that Congress and the president preferred to avoid, prompting impeach Earl Warren, signs to blossom among the nation's highways. Uh, the unanimous decision of the Warren Court in Brown v. the Board of Education in Topeka, Kansas in 1958 was epical. In forceful opinion, the justices ruled that segregation of public schools was inherently unequal and thus unconstitutional. The uncompromising decision reversed the court's earlier declaration of 1896 in Plessy v. Ferguson that separate but equal facilities were constitutional. De de desegregation, the justice announces, must go ahead with all deliberate speed. Um, so we get paragraph that I just read. The first one was uh, you're getting a Chief Justice Earl Warren, former governor of California. Uh, one thing the book doesn't say is he actually desegregated schools in California when he was governor of California. Um, so while this is surprising that he's a Republican and he's going to push for this, uh, it really isn't all that much surprising knowing his prior policy, previous policy in California. Uh, so what we end up getting is Brown versus Board of Education. It rules Plessy versus Ferguson is unconstitutional. It says that obviously desegregation does not mean separate and equal. The border states generally made reasonable efforts to comply with this ruling, but in Deep South, Die Hard organized massive resistance against desegregation. More than 100 Southern congressional representatives and senators signed the Declaration of Constitutional Principles in 1953, pledging their unyielding resistance to desegregation. Several states diverted public funds. Tehassee created private schools 
uh, where the integration order was more difficult to apply. Throughout the South, white citizen councils, sometimes by a light of burning crosses, thwarted attempts to make integration a reality. Ten years later, the course momentous ruling, fewer than 2% of the eligible blacks in the Deep South were sitting in classrooms in the whites. So all in all, what you want to see here is desegregation was happening in the border states in the North. I mean, where it did, where segregation was present, um, but not necessarily so much in the South. In fact, I think it's alarming to know that 10 years later, only 2% of schools were actually desegregated. <laughs> President Eisenhower remained reluctant to promote legislation. He shied away from employing his vast popularity and prestige of his office to educate white Americans about the need for racial justice. His personal attitudes may have helped to restrain him. He had grown up in an all-white town, spent his career in a segregated army, and advised against integration of the armed forces in 1948. He complained that the Supreme Court's decision in Brown v. the Board of Education had upset the customs and convictions of at least two generations of Americans, and he steadfastly refused to issue a public statement endorsing the court's conclusions. I do not believe, he explained, that prejudices, even palpably unjustifiable prejudices, will succumb, will succumb to compulsion. So what this is saying is, I mean, President Eisenhower, he's growing up in a completely white, desegregated world. So as a result of this, this experience isn't necessarily pushing him to uh, enforce desegregation. But in September 1957, Ike was forced to act. Orville Faubus, what an ugly name, the governor of Arkansas, mobilized the National Guard to prevent nine black students from enrolling in Little Rock Central Arkansas High School. Confronted with the direct challenge to federal authority, Eisenhower sent troops to escort the children to their class. In the same year, Congress passed the Civil Rights Act, since uh, passed the first Civil Rights Act since Reconstruction. Eisenhower characteristically reassured a Southern senator that the legislation represented the mildest civil rights bill possible. It set up a permanent civil rights commission to investigate a uh, violation of civil rights and authorize federal injunctions to protect voting civil rights. Uh, so we end up getting is in 1957, Little Rock High School, Little Rock Nine. Um, Orville Faubus, he's not, he's not letting this high school desegregate. So uh, Eisenhower has to go ahead and send the military in, right, the army. Uh, and then at the same time, you're also getting the first Civil Rights Act that's passing uh, during Eisenhower's admin. Blacks, meanwhile, continue to take the civil rights movement into their own leadership and in their own hands. Martin Luther King Jr. formed the SLC, or SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, in 1957. It aimed to mobilize the vast power of black churches on behalf of black rights. That was an exceptionally shrewd strategy because the churches were the largest and best organized black institutions that had been allowed to flourish in the segregated society. More spontaneous was a sit-in movement launched in February 1, 1960 by four, four black college freshmen in Greensboro, New North Carolina. Without a detailed plan or institutional support, they demand service at whites only Woolworths lunch counter, observing that fellows like you make your race look bad. Even a black waitress refused to serve them, but they kept receipts and returned the next day with 19 classmates. The following day, 85 students joined in. By the end of the week, 1,000. The sit-in movement rolled swiftly across the South, swelling into a wave of waitings, lions, prayings, uh, to compel equal treatment in restaurants, transportation, employment, housing, and voter registration. In April 1960, Southern Blacks formed the SNCC, SNCC, to give more focus and force to these efforts. Young and impassioned SNCC members would eventually lose patience uh, with the more stately tactics of SCLC and even more deliberate legalisms of NAACP. So you're getting the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee uh, that are, of course, using these sit-ins uh, to help desegregate some of these businesses. Uh, less structured than the SCLC as well as the NAACP, um, but still very successful from the grassroots movement. All right, so a couple of things, uh, sweat versus painter. Uh, one of the things that this rule was that professional schools uh, were not equal, therefore they should not be separate. Uh, Rosa Parks, bus, right? Uh, she kind of fought for the desegregation of the buses, which led to the Montgomery bus boycott where African-Americans refused to ride the bus system in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, which led to a huge fall in revenue, which would then lead to the desegregation of the buses. Uh, Warren, he would go ahead and rule Chief Justice of the Supreme Court rule separate but equal was unconstitutional. Uh, he, would, he would kind of push for a desegregation of all public school systems. 
discuss the impact of a decision and um, discuss the impact of the NAS decision. Well, I mean, it was impactful in a lot of the border states, but only 2% of the South actually desegregated the schools. Eisenhower didn't really do much to enforce it. He didn't really enforce it until uh, the Little Rock Nine, um, in Central, Little, I believe, the Central Little Rock High School, where um, Orville Faubus refused to desegregate the school, and Eisenhower had to bring the military in. Uh, so he did very little. What did the Civil Rights Act of 1957 provide? Uh, it provided the creation of a Civil Rights Commission uh, to investigate any infringement of civil rights. Um, yeah. What was the SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Committee? This was headed by Martin Luther King Jr. It provided nonviolent um, solutions to uh, civil rights. Discussed the sit-in movement in 1960s. So this is when you were getting a lot of teenagers, a lot of college students that were sitting in businesses uh, in segregated areas. So a lot of African-Americans as well as white students that would go ahead and um, try to break these desegregation laws by sitting in the I guess the section that they were not allowed to sit in. Uh, it was less organized, so finally they would form SNCC, which is Student Nonviolent um, Committee, right, uh, to help provide some structure with these sit-ins for the younger people. I also want to add uh, voting rights, right? It was also the 57 Civil Rights Act also meant to protect voting rights in states. I am going to skip Republicanism at home. I do want to get through here. All right. A new look in foreign policy. The 1952 Republican platform called for a new look in foreign policy. It condemned mere containment of communism as negative, futile, and immoral. Incoming Secretary of State John Dules promised not merely to stem the red tide, to roll back its gain and, and liberate captive peoples. At the same time, the new administration promised to balance the budget by cutting military spending. <laughs> Uh, Secretary of State John Dewey, can you know who he is, his name's going to come up quite often. How were there two contradictory goals to be reached? Those answered to a policy of boldness in 1954. Eisenhower would uh, relegate the Army and the Navy to the back seat and build up the strategic air command air fleet of the super bombers equipped with flattening uh, nuclear bombs. Uh, these fearsome weapons would inflict massive retaliation on the Soviets or the Chinese in events of hostilities. The advantages of this new policy were taught to lie in the power of nuclear intimidation and its relatively cheap price tag. At the same time, Eisenhower sought a thaw in the Cold War through negotiations with new Soviet leaders who came to power after Joseph Stalin's death in 1953. Uh, so what we end up getting here is Eisenhower wants to regulate the Army and the Navy. However, he wants to build up uh, the Strategic Air Command, which is an air fleet that gave us super bombers uh, and a lot of drop nuclear weapons. Uh, what he also wants to do is, um, Eisenhower is trying to better relations in the Cold War. In the end, uh, the touted new look provo uh, proved illusory. A new Soviet premier, the, brutally, the, br the burly Nikita Khrushchev, brutally rejected ICE call in 1955 for an open skies mutual inspection program over both the Soviet and United States. In 1956, the Hungarians rose up against their Soviet's masters and... Um, and felt badly betrayed when the United States turned a deaf ear uh, to the desperate appeals for aid. The brutally, this uh, brutally crushed the Hungarian uprising, uh, revealed the sobering truth that America's mighty nuclear sledgehammer was too heavy a weapon to yield in such a relatively minor crisis. The strategic limitations of the massive retaliation doctrine were thus starkly exposed. Um, so, okay, uh, so... Where were we? Sorry, guys, lost my train of thought. All right, let's continue. The Vietnam Nightmare. The Vietnam Nightmare. Southeast Asia provided further illustration of those limitations. In Vietnam and elsewhere, nationalist movements had sought for years to throw off the yoke of French colonial rule. The legendary Vietnamese leader, goaded Ho Chi Minh, had tried to appeal personally to Woodrow Wilson in Paris as early as 1919 to support self-determination for the people of South Asia. Franklin Roosevelt likewise inspired hope among Asian nationalists. Um, so what's happening here is 
remember in the last section that I read, they said in America, we focus too much on large scale uh, nuclear weapons or bombings of aircraft, using aircraft. Um, and what this first paragraph says here is that, generally speaking, the weapons that we created would not be successful in Vietnam, right? That's what's kind of foreshadowing. Um, Ho Chi Minh, of, when you're looking at the legendary Vietnamese leader, what this paragraph is saying is that he actually tried uh, to work with Woodrow Wilson and FDR uh, to give the freedom of people of Southeast Asia from the French. But Cold War events dampened the, the dreams of anti-colonial Asian peoples. Their leaders, including Ho Chi Minh, became increasingly communist, while the United States became increasingly anti-communist. By 1954, American taxpayers were financing nearly 80% of the cost of a bottomless French colonial war in Indochina. The United States shared a amount of about $1 billion a year, given partly as a bid to win French approval for a plan to rearm West Germany. So, in the 1950s, uh, Ho Chi Minh and a lot of the Southeast Asian governments, I mean, they were all what we called Indochina. They were, they were, they were all called Indochina, and at that point, at that point, they were all occupied by the French. Uh, the United States were giving money uh, to help to support the French government to ensure that communism is not spreading. Despite this massive aid, French forces continued to crumble under pressure from Ho Chi Minh's nationalist guerrilla forces, called the Viet Minh. In 1954, a French garrison was hope was trapped hopelessly in the fortress of Dien Bien Phu in the northwestern corner of Vietnam. The new policy of boldness was now put to this test. Secretary Doles, Vice President Nixon, and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff favored intervention with an American bombers to help bail out the beleaguered French, but Eisenhower held back. The Battle of Dien Bien Phu provided victory for nationalists in the multi-nation conference in Geneva, roughly half Vietnam at the 7th parallel. The victorious, the victorious Ho Chi Minh in the north consented to his arrangement on the assurance the Viet-wide Viet elections would be held within two years. In the south, the pro-Western government under No Dien Diem was soon entrenched at Saigon. Convinced that the communists would win, Dien's regime and its American backers refused to hold the promised unification elections. Uh, American aid, nonetheless, continued as communist guerrillas heated up their campaign against Diem. The Americans had evidently backed the losing horse, but could no easy way to call off their bet. Uh, so what we end up getting here, first thing is, um, we end up getting, here it is, the Battle of Dinh Bien Phu. Uh, this is, a, victor this is a, uh, a war that you're getting between the nationalists as well as the communist government. The communists uh, is, uh, they're more successful uh, but the Geneva Conference uh, calls for kind of a stopping of this, splits North and South Vietnam, and then it also says that in two years we'll have an election, right? Uh, however, if the elections were to happen, Americans know that communism is going to spread. Uh, they're probably going to have a more communist-style leader or government. So what we're doing is we're supporting the nationalist government uh, through the use of military and through the use of financial aid. Um, and we could, yeah, so, and that's the Battle of Dinh Phu, this is actually a, a military engagement with the French colonial Vietnam in which the French forces were defeated by the Viet Minh. So I apologize. I want to make that clear is that, uh, you're getting, it's not the nationalists versus communists going against each other yet. What you end up getting, it's the French going against the communist party, right? The French going against the people of Vietnam, right? Uh, the French were defeated by the Viet Minh. Viet Minh during this time. And then we're getting the split of North and South Vietnam. But the goal is to unite them through elections two years later. And Americans know they have a feeling that this is going to lead to the spread of communism. So we're supporting the Nationalist Party. So what led to the Battle of Dien Phu Phu is just French colonization, right? The people of Vietnam wanted their freedom. So Viet Minh uh, was where they were able to push back uh, the French. Uh, what was the side of the Geneva Conference? Use your resources. What was the side of was that um, that at this point French or Vietnam would be split North and South Vietnam, but eventually it would be unification of Vietnam through elections. Uh, but of course, this leads to the Vietnam War between North and South Vietnam, with America supporting South Vietnam. Okay. Cold War crisis in the Middle East. 
Fears of Soviet penetration in the oil-rich Middle East further heightened Cold War tensions. The government of Iran, supportedly influenced by Kremlin, began to resist the power of gigantic Western companies that controlled Iranian petroleum. In response, the American CIA helped to engineer a coup in 1953 and install the youthful Shah of Iran, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, as a kind of dictator. Though successful in the short run in securing Iranian oil over the West, the American intervention left a bitter legacy of resentment among many Iranians. More than two decades later, they took their revenge on the Shah and his American allies. So uh, what we end up getting here is in 1953, the CIA, the American Central Intelligence Intelligence Agency, were in engineering a coup to overthrow the Shah of Iran. And we put in Mohammad Reza Pahlavi. He's a West, he's a dictator, but he supports the West, right? He's securing Iranian oil for the West, anyone that's not a communist. Uh, so you wonder why today Iran hates us so much. It goes back to this, right? In 1979, later on, uh, you're getting um, just uh, the uh, those that are against Westerners in America and this dictator, uh, they're able to overthrow them in the 1979 Iranian Revolution. And ever since then, I mean, from the 1950s onward, you're getting these bitter relations between America as well as Iran. The Suez Crisis proved for a far messier than a swift stroke in Iran. President Gamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt, an ardent Arab nationalist, was seeking funds to build an immense dam on the Upper Nile for urgently needed irrigation and power. American Britain tentatively offered financial help, but when Nasser began to flirt openly with the communist camp, Secretary of State Doles dramatically withdrew the dam offer. Um, Nasser promptly regained face by nationalizing the Suez Canal, owned uh, chiefly by British and French stockholders. Nasser's plan uh, placed a razor's edge at the jugular vein of Western Europe's oil supply. America's jittery French and British allies deliberately keeping Washington in the dark and coordinating, and coordinating their blow with one from Israel, staged a joint assault on Egypt late in 1956. The invaders miscalculated the United States would supply them with oil uh, while their Middle Eastern suppliers were disrupted. But to their unpleasant surprise, a furious President Eisenhower resolved to let them boil in their own oil and refused to release emergency supplies. The oilless allies recently withdrew their troops and for the first time in history, United Nations police were forced to... So what we end up getting here is Nasser, uh, he wants to build a dam and he was going to use American money. But when we found out that he was negotiating with the Soviets uh, in other ways, we went ahead and we stopped uh, giving him money. But Great Britain... So what Nasser does is he actually goes ahead and he takes the Suez Canal, which was owned by Great Britain and France, and he nationalizes it. As a result of this, Britain and France go ahead and attack a planned invasion without letting the United States know of, of um, attacking Egypt with the aid of Israel. And with, in retaliation, we're upset that we weren't notified, so we don't let Egypt – or we don't, let, we don't supply Great Britain and France with any resources to, to help. The Suez Crisis marked the last time that the United States could brandish its oil weapon. As recently as 1940, the United States had produced two-thirds of the world's oil, while a scant 5% of the global supply flowed from the Middle East. But by 1948, the United States had become a net oil importer. In economically and strategic importance in the Middle East, oil region began to grow dramatically. So what this is saying is prior to this, we were one of the largest, if not the largest, oil um, producer. But now we are more. We had we become more reliant on the Middle East. Everyone becomes more reliant on the Middle East for oil. The region's poor, uh, sandy sheikdoms increasingly resolved to reap for themselves a lion's share of enormous oil wealth that Western companies pumped out of the scorching deserts. The Portuguese moved Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Iraq, and Iran joined with Venezuela in 1960 to form OPEC. In the next two decades, OPEC further tightens its strange hold on Western economies. So. Uh, as I stated, remember America was very influential in the oil uh, industry, but by the 1940s, we're losing this influence to a lot of Middle Eastern nations. And these Middle Eastern nations are very anti-Western, and they're going to, a lot of them are, and they're going to go ahead and set these restrictions later on. So you need to know what OPEC is. This is the cartel. Um, think about it as almost like a uh, directorate of uh, oil exporting nations together and what they do is they set the prices they set limitations on who can access this oil round two for ike so i'm actually going to skip this 
cover all these questions right here. Uh, we talked about Geneva Conference. Of course, that's the resolution of um, in the start of the Vietnam War. Uh, why did the Cold War tensions develop in the Middle East? Reason being is oil. Oil, oil, oil. Russia, so you don't want access to that oil. We want to limit their access to that oil. Uh, so that's why we end up um, throwing the coup in Iran. What led to the Suez Crisis? Uh, you're going to need the nationalization of the uh, canal, right, in, um, of the Egyptian the Suez Canal. Uh, Egypt gets in a war with Great Britain, France, and Israel. Um, all in all, this leads to this anti-Western uh, perspective, which wants to limit the amount of oil that Westerners get. And that's OPEC, right? This cartel of oil exporting countries that get to decide who and who does not get this oil, right? We are almost finished. Continuing Cold War. Fantastic's race to create weapons. So all in all, what you need to understand about this section, round two for Ike, is we get what we call uh, the space races. Uh, one of the things that we do is we go ahead and we launch uh, the first, um, well, the Soviets go ahead. And the Soviet uh, scientists down by the world in October, 19, uh, October 4, 1957, by lofting in orbit, uh, the first uh, satellite in space, which would be the Sputnik. Right. Um, so, of course, we get in what we call space races uh, when we try to go ahead um, to just uh, we try to go ahead and develop uh, more uh, science to be able to compete uh, with being able to launch spaces and uh, or launch uh, satellites into space. Right. So just uh, that's what you understand is the space race is what we're getting. This race to education on who can become most scientific and in regards to outer space technology. So the continuing Cold War. The fantastic uh, race to create weapons of nuclear annihilation continued uh, unabated. Worried scientists urged halting nuclear tests before the atmosphere became so polluted as to produce generations of deformed mutants. The Soviets, after completing an intensive series of exceptionally dirty tests, proclaimed a suspension in March 1958 and urged the Western world to follow. But attempts to regularize suspensions by proper inspection sank under reef of mutual mistrust. Uh, Bruce Khrushchev, meanwhile, demanded in 1958 that Western powers remove their forces from West Berlin and sought a face to face meeting with Eisenhower. Despite giving doubts on any tangible results, the president invited the Soviet leader to America in 1959. Khrushchev appeared before the UN General Assembly before holding an encouraging meeting with Eisenhower and Camp David, the presidential retreat in Maryland's uh, Kakatoon Mountains. Optimism evaporated when a follow-up Paris summit conference scheduled for May 1960 uh, turned an embarrassing fiasco. On the EVE conference, the Soviets shot down the American U-2 spy plane deep in the heart of Russia. After bungling bureaucratic denials in Washington, Honest Ike, took the unpresented step of assuming personal responsibility. Khrushchev stormed into Paris, uh, filling, with air, filling the air with invective, and the conference collapsed before it could get the ground. The Concord of Camp David was replaced with the grapes of wrath. So what, you, what this is talking about is uh, as the Soviets began to, in the early 1950s, they began to test more nuclear weapons. So do we. Uh, they eventually started to halt with these weapons, and uh, Khrushchev would actually meet with Eisenhower, but you're going to get a U-2 spy plane, that ends up being shot down, an American spy plane in Russia. This dissolves uh, the conference and any further stop to the Cold War. Meanwhile, the Cold War shook America's relations with its spheric neighbors. Latin America is bitterly resented Uncle Sam's lavishing billions of dollars on Europe while doling out millions to its poor relations to the South. They also shaped that Washington's continuing habit of intervening in Latin American affairs as in the CIA direct coup that ousted the leftist government in Guatemala. And at the same time, uh, Washington continued to support, even decorate, bloody dictators who claimed to be combating communists. One such dictator, Iron Fisted Fulencio Batista of Cuba, had encouraged huge investments of American capital, and Washington in turn had given him support. But early 1959, the black bearded Fidel Castro engineered a revolution that ousted Batista. Castro then denounced the Yankee imperialists and began to expropriate valuable American properties while pursuing a land distribution program. 
Washington, finally losing patience, released Cuba from imperialistic slavery by cutting off heavy imports of Cuban sugar. Castro retaliated with further wholesale confiscations of Yankee property, and in fact made his left-wing dictatorship an economic and military satellite of Moscow to the Kremlin's delight of surprise. An exodus of anti-Castro Cubans headed for the U.S., especially Florida. Nearly one million arrived between 1960 and 2000. So... Washington broke democratic relations with Castro's government early in 1961 and imposed a strict embargo on trade with Cuba up until this day. So a couple of things, a lot of Latin American countries are becoming frustrated with the United States because they're investing billions in Europe, but only millions in Latin America. And remember, this, we had a good neighbor policy of FDR that said, we're, we're not going to intervene in your policies. But yet, through Guatemala um, and also Cuba, you could see that we've implemented fascist dictators that support uh, that are against communism and support democracy. Uh, Fidel Castro would be a perfect example of this. Um, this last paragraph talks about how the United States tried to put in Fuencio Batista of Cuba, a dictator uh, that was terrible towards the Cuban people, but great towards American business. Uh, eventually, Fidel Castro was able to overthrow Cuba, and C Castro supports communism, and he has a very strong relations with the United oh, with the Soviet Union, and this that America hates. Right? We're very upset about this. Um, so as a result, uh, we stopped trade with Cuba, um, and eventually this is going to lead to the Bay of Pigs, and as well as the Cuban Missile Crisis. So, with that in mind, I would like you guys to get right here. Um, where were we? I'm going to skip around. Let's go to Cuban confrontations. Although the United States regarded Latin American countries as backyard, its southern neighbors, feared and resented the powerful of the Colossus North. In 1961, Kennedy extended the hand of friendship with the Alliance for Progress, hailed as a Marshall Plan for Latin America, and intended to quiet communist agitation. So Kennedy wants to stop uh, the spread of communism through what we call the alliance, the, alliance, the alliance for progress. But results were disappointing. There was little alliance and even less progress. American handouts had little positive impact on Latin America's immense social problems. President Kennedy also struck, struck below the border with brass knuckles. He had inherited from Eisenhower administration a uh, CIA backsheet to topple Fidel Castro from power by invading Cuba with anti-communist exiles. On April 17, some 1,200 exiles landed at Cuba's Bay of Pigs. When the uh, ill-starred Bay of Pigs invasion bogged down, Kennedy stood fast in the decision to keep hands off, and the bullet-riddled band of anti-Castrites surrendered. So what the uh, – because remember, Cuba is now communist, so what we start to do is – America starts to do is under the Eisenhower administration, they planned the Bay of Pigs invasion. Uh, remember that there were a lot of anti-Castro individuals that would leave Cuba and head to Florida. Well, what the U.S. government did was they trained these rebels and they sent them back to Cuba in hopes of overthrowing Castro. We are not successful in doing so. The Bay of Pigs blunder, along with continuing American covert efforts to assassinate Castro and overthrow his government, naturally pushed the Cuban leader even closer to the Soviet Union. Woolly Chairman um, Khrushchev lost little time in taking full advantage of his Cuban comrades' location, just 90 miles of Florida's coast. In October 8, 1962, aerial photographs by American spy planes revealed that the Soviets were merely secretly and speedily installing nuclear-tipped missiles in Cuba. So uh, as a result of us trying to overthrow Castro, our relationship uh, with, um, or sorry, Castro's relationship with the Soviet Union gets stronger. And one of the things that the Soviet Union is they're sending nuclear missiles to Cuba. Kennedy and Khrushchev now began a nerve-wracking game of nuclear chicken. Uh, the president flatly rejected the Air Force proposals for a surgical bombing strike against the missile launching sites. Instead, on October 22, 1962, he ordered a naval quarantine of Cuba and demanded an immediate removal of the threatening weaponry. He also served notice on Khrushchev that any attack on the United States from Cuba would trigger a nuclear retaliation against the Russian heartland. So... What Kennedy is telling him is uh, telling Khrushchev is that um, 
he orders a naval quarantine of Cuba, demand immediate removal of threatening weapons. So get rid of all your nuclear weapons in Cuba. And that if there's any attack on the United States from Cuba, that means that, hey, we are going to attack Russia as well as Cuba. For an anxious week, Americans waited while Soviet ships approached a patrol line established by the U.S. Navy on the island of Cuba. The world teetered breathlessly on the brink of global atomization. Only in 1991 did the full dimensions of the singular peril become known when the Russians revealed that the ground forces in Cuba already had operational nuclear weapons at their disposal and were authorized to launch them if attacked. In this uh, tense eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball confrontation, Khrushchev finally flinched. On October 28, he agreed to partially face-saving compromise by which he would pull the missiles out of Cuba. The United States, in return, agreed to end the quarantine and not invade the island. The American government also quietly signaled that it would remove from Turkey some of its own missiles targeted in the Soviet Union. So all in all, I mean, uh, you know, Khrushchev agrees to take out his uh, weapons from Cuba, and we would stop quarantining Cuba as well, you know, allowing them to have some trade. Uh, at the same time, we would say uh, we get our weapons out of Turkey because Turkey is very close to uh, Russia. Follow-up from the Cuban Missile Crisis was considerable. A disgraced Khrushchev was ultimately hounded out of the Kremlin and became an unperson. Hardliners in Moscow, while never going to be humiliated, nuclear face-off launched an enormous program of military expansion. Kennedy, apparently sobered by the polygon risk that he had just run, pushed harder for a nuclear test ban treaty with the Soviet Union. After prolonged negotiations in Moscow, a pact prohibiting trial nuclear explosions in the atmosphere was signed in late 1963. Another barometer indicating a thaw and cold war was installation in the August 1963 of a Moscow-Washington hotline, permitting immediate teletype communications in case of crisis. Uh, so we're getting some thawing of relations. I mean, the Cuban Missile Crisis, of course, ruins uh, Khrushchev, and he is out of power. Most significant was Kennedy's speech at American University in Washington. Uh, the president urged Americans to abandon the view of the Soviet Union as a devil-ridden land filled with fanatics. Instead, deal with the world as it is, as it might not have been the industry of the last 18 years been different. Kennedy thus tried to lay the foundation of realistic policy of peaceful coexistence with the Soviet Union. Here were the modest origins of the policy that became known later as Dente, or French relaxation of tension. So I went over this. Um, so obviously we trained Castro rebels in America, sent them back to Cuba to overthrow Castro. Castro was able to put down his rebellion and this pushes him closer to the Soviets because it makes him more anti-American. Um, so I went over this as well. Soviet missiles are discovered in Cuba, right? As a result of this, what we end up doing is we put a naval quarantine in Cuba, right? Uh, we then go ahead and we tell the Soviet Union we want immediate re removal of Soviet weapons. Um, and of course, there were nuclear weapons that were there. And Cubans were instructed to use these weapons if the island was attacked. Eventually, Khrushchev flinches. There's removal of Soviet unions. Um, and U.S. missiles are also um, removed from Turkey, right? Long term, Soviets, Khrushchev is out of power. Um, Americans and Soviets, for both of us, this leads to kind of more further thawing of the Cold War, ways to limit uh, nuclear weapons. All right. I know that was very quick, but go back to the reading, double check. A lot of information. This is a big chapter. Most important thing you want to make sure you understand is uh, the civil rights movement, but as well as the Cold War.